All right, so this is a chapter seven addendum. Uh, there's a few topics I wanted to very briefly cover from throughout the chapter that kind of can't have their own video. They don't really hold enough weight, so I'm just doing that. Uh, I'm covering sections two, three, four, and five from the apply the concepts uh, portion of this chapter. As always, you should go through it yourself um, as it gives you really good practice with a lot of the stuff we've been working on in this chapter. All right, so in section A7.2 of the textbook, um, they talk about this password creator right here, where I can type in a whole bunch of words and it tries to give me a password. So um, I really love coding in uh, Visual Basic. Isn't that sweet? I can create the password. Uh, you get capital I, seven, lowercase r, lowercase l, lowercase c, lowercase i, capital V, capital B, like that. What it's essentially doing is it is uh, smashing together the first word of, sorry, the first character of every word in this string, uh, I, R, L, C, I, VB, with the proper capitalization, of course. And then what it does is it takes the number, essentially the number of words in the string. It takes the length of the string that it gets when it smashes together all the first letters of the first words. It takes that number and then it inserts it into the first position, or sorry, the first index, the second position of our string. And we end up with this a uh, mix of letters and one single number. Um, I just wanted to bring this up to say that it is an awful, awful way to make a password. And please do not take this as password advice for your own passwords. Um, it's really not great, specifically because it creates passwords that are so short and that are not easy to remember. Um, I mean, you can remember the phrase, I suppose, and then recreate the password from that phrase, but it's really not memorable by itself. So you're going to forget it and then you're going to change it to something that's more memorable and less secure probably, and all that kind of stuff. But the length of it is especially such an issue because when people are trying to break into accounts like that. They're not trying passwords like manually or anything like that. They are doing a process called brute forcing, which is, well, it's a ge very general term, but when it comes to password cracking, they're actually trying to automatically generate passwords. Maybe they're using a password dictionary of very commonly used passwords. Maybe they are gen generating some themselves, but they're looking for things that are short that can be easily guessed because a password like this, uh, each one of these characters is, let's say, um, in the case of only using letters and numbers like this, each character only has uh, 36 possibilities. And then that's 36 possibilities across um, eight characters right here. Uh, 36 to the 8th power, that's not a ton of things for a computer to try to check randomly, and it's not even doing it randomly. It's, uh, it's There's a lot of really smart programs out there, so it is not very secure. What you want is something very long and something very memorable. Uh, in the, um, probably the wrap-up page, I will link this video, but I'll probably also try to link the video on the page for this video on Canvas. I'm going to put an interview that uh, J John Oliver did with Edward Snowden about seven years ago, where Snowden gave some excellent password advice that still holds up to this day for making very memorable and very strong passwords uh, that would resist both human and computer exploitation. So I highly recommend you look at that and consider that when you're making future passwords, but especially do not use this method in order to make passwords. It is extremely, extremely insecure. I 
I don't know. I, I feel like it's my duty to um, talk about this as a professor and also someone who knows at least a little bit about computer security. Um, I, I feel like it's very important for me to share. The next topic is random number generation. So what if you want to generate a value randomly between two numbers? Um, you can't necessarily have the user input some value randomly that they come up with because people aren't really good at making random numbers and you can't really do random numbers yourself for the same reason. People aren't good at making random numbers. So what we have is in computing and well, in, in, math, in math in general, but it gets applied in computing, is something called a pseudo-random number generator. And we call it pseudo-random because true randomness cannot be replicated by human or machine. Our machines can make it look pretty random so that we can't guess the next number very consistently, but we can't ever achieve true randomness. We just have some fancy math that makes it look like we've achieved true randomness that has all sorts of things to do with, like, prime numbers and modulus arithmetic and all kinds of crazy stuff. But it's an algorithm that makes a sequence of supposedly random numbers. Do not use this for security purposes for any reason because it's not very good for security. It's just a very basic random number generator. There's a lot of ways that this stuff can be exploited, so don't use it for security. I, I feel like I have to talk about that given the uh, password stuff in this chapter. Anyway. What you would do in your code in order to get random numbers is you use a random object to represent one. So it is an actual object. We talked a little bit about objects throughout Visual Basic, and we've used a lot of things that without knowing are objects, like all the controls and stuff, like they kind of are objects even though we don't really know that they are objects. So You've already been interacting with them. You know how to use the properties of an object, the methods of an object, all that kind of stuff. Well, random is very much like interacting with all these different controls. It is an object. It has properties. It has methods. Um, so you use one of these random objects to represent some pseudo random number generator in your code the same way that you would use a uh, control object to represent a button or a label or a text box or something like that in your code. Now, when you want to use a random object, this is where it kind of differs from the controls that you're used to using, because when you're creating a new control, you actually do that in the designer and you place it on your application, you drag it into place and you set all those things, you know, the properties on the menu over to the right side. When you're working with a random object, you have to actually do it a different way. You don't add it to your application through the designer. You actually create it within your code, within your procedures, or it would be within your procedures. Um, you define it as you would a variable. So dim, and then you do the name. The ID that we're using is rand, R-A-N-D, and then I just have gen afterwards for, you know, random generator, right? Uh, and then you say as new random uh, instead of the type. So, you know, when you normally declare a variable, right? After the as, you would put integer or double or string or whatever. But this is as new random. It declares the type when you have random over here, but also saying the word new means that you're not just saying this is a variable of this type that, ha you know, it's like a slot with this type or anything like that. You're actually creating a new object. It works differently than it does for the basic data types that we've been working with before. You're creating this new object that you're playing with that uh, gets instantiated. It has its own like loading type of procedures. It sets up certain things like the uh, first random number is going to generate and uh, it has um, its whole collection of methods and all that kind of stuff. But when you say new like that, you're telling Visual Basic to create a new one of these, which actually means that you're able to have multiple random number generators, multiple of these random objects that are set up separately from each other using this new 
uh, keyword, and they can have different values. They can be generating different values. So two random number generators that you generate at the same time are not going to give you the same values. They're going to give you different random numbers from each other if you're asking them for those random numbers uh, at the same time. So that's what's really cool about using objects like this. When you create a new random object like this, you're creating a new generator that starts at a new value and gives you new values from any other random generator that you might see. Um, so yes, rand, rand gen is a random object. You use new because it is an object, specifically because it's an object. You wouldn't use new for integers or decimals or doubles or anything like that. You use new because you're making a random object and we're using this R-A-N-D ID to denote the type. In order to get integers out of a random number generator, and we're only able to get integers using this random object right here. In order to get a random integer, you use the next method. Uh, and this next method takes in two values, int low and int high. These define the boundaries for your new random integer that you are generating. So the integer will be greater than or equal to int low, and it will be less than, strictly less than, int high. So for example, if I pass in 1 and 51, into the next method, it will give me a number between 1 and 50 inclusive, not including 51. If I pass in negative 10 and 20 into the next method, when I call that using randgen, um, it will give me a number between negative 10 and positive 19 inclusive, not including 20. All right, so now what I want to talk about is a property and a method that belongs to a lot of controls that you've already seen. So a lot of controls will have the enabled property, which determines if that control will actually respond to a user. For example, if the user is actually able to type into a text box or if they are able to press a button or something like that. Uh, it is a Boolean value uh, when it is true and it's true by default. The user is able to interact with it. When it's false, uh, they can't interact with it, and that control will actually dim. It will turn sort of a uh, more gray or something like that. It loses its opacity to indicate that it's not available for use, so the user is actually able to tell that they can't use it. However, having a control that is uh, disabled, or where the enabled property is false, it does imply that that control will be enabled at some point. Because if the control is just never able to be used, if it is disabled the entire time with no possible way of being enabled, then why include the control in the first place? If there is a possible way to use it, then it's fine to disable it. You don't even have to re-enable it if you don't ha if it doesn't work for the purpose of your application, but that control should be usable at least once in some possible way. There, there has to be some path for the user to be able to use that control, some path of interaction where they can use it. Otherwise, um, why include it at all, right? So it can be a really helpful property for something, you know, making some functionality temporarily uh, unavailable. Let's say if you want to make it unavailable when the input text box is empty, or if the text box does not have the um, correct type of input in it, or something like that, you know, that could be a possibility. It, it depends on what works and what makes sense and what feels natural to use. And then we have the focus method. Uh, now, of course, focus, as a, a reminder, is when you are interacting with a particular control, that control has focus. It is able to be used either, um, well, you know, primarily with your keyboard, for example. So your control has focus if you can press enter and 
activate it. Like when you tab over to a button, you can press enter. Or when you uh, click into or tab into a text box and you're able to type in it, that has focus. So you can use the focus method of a control in order to give that control focus. Let the user interact with it immediately. All right, so this is the guess a letter game that the textbook uh, gives. Although I did make a couple of changes. Um, the first one, if you end up doing it yourself, which you should, uh, being that I ended up disabling the guess text box text box before a game is actually run. In the second, we'll get to in a second. But the idea is that I can click new game and notice that the text box to make a guess in and the check guess button are both uh, unavailable. Which means I cannot click them. I can click check guess all I want. I can click this guess text box all I want. I can hit tab all I want. I can even hit the access key for guess and nothing happens because it is disabled as well as the access key for check. You can't hear it uh, because I have my desktop audio muted, but my computer is screaming at me because I keep on mashing the C button. Now, if I press new game, it has generated a letter and it is allowing me to make a guess. So I'll guess the letter A and I'll check the guess. And it says guess again. I guess I got it wrong. It also lists my guess up here and clears out what was in the guess text box. Um, I'll try Z. Oh. I'll try Z. There we go. Guess again. R. Guess again. And so on and so forth. Um, and essentially what's happening here. They define an alphabet string like this, which is a little bit clunky, but they define this alphabet string and then they make a random object and actually get a random number like this. They then choose the random number between 0 inclusive and 26 exclusive because the valid indices here are 0 and 25 and everything in between, of course. Also, there's this uh, string, this class level string up here, private string random letter as string. That's going to be the um, random letter that we are looking for. So now uh, string random letter is going to be the uh, you know, this string alphabet, right? Indexing into it using this random number that was generated. And then after, you know, because we're doing all this when we click the new game button. After all that, it uh, empties out all the previous guesses if this is uh, a subsequent game. And then it enables the check button and it enables the guess button. Although I did add that one myself. And it gives the text box focus. So it makes the text box enabled and it also switches focus to the text box, which means that uh, if I click the button, it immediately switches over to the text box so I can start typing immediately, which can be useful in some applications. Um, you do have to be careful when you use focus like this. If there's a possibility where your application, uh, you know, maybe your user is entering the same value multiple times for some cumulative calculation or something like that. Um, they might want to able to keep on clicking it over and over and over and over again, especially if they are only using the keyboard, if they're only using tab and smashing enter over and over and over and over again. If you use focus like this, uh, these users are going, they'll press enter once and immediately switch back over to the text box and then have to tab back over to your button and then press enter and then it switches over to the text box. I have to tab back over to the button. So that's not ideal. You have to test this stuff out for usability for any type of keyboard interaction, whether that's tab and enter, whether that's access keys, whatever. But you know, that that's the message about being careful with focus right here. But in this case, it works really well because you're only uh, guessing one letter one at a time. Uh, you're not going to guess the same letter multiple times because it's not going to make it more correct. It's only, you know, they choose one 
random letter and then that random letter stays the same until you do the next game. So why keep on making the same guess over and over and over again when the random letter doesn't change until you guess the correct random letter, right? So that's why you shouldn't do that. And then of course when it's actually checking the guess, uh, it takes your guess, um, puts your guess in the label, and then checks to see if your guess was correct. Either it is correct or it is not. If it is not, we'll do the easy case first. It just slaps up a message that says guess again, and then exits. Uh, empties out the guess text box, which is helpful, um, and then gives that text box focus. However, if you get a true, if you actually guess it, it will give you the notification that you got the correct answer, um, and then disable the check button, disable the guess button. The only thing you can do at that point is either click new game or exit. Uh, I guess I should also really hone in on how we create the random number generator right here. Uh, dim rand gen as new random. Uh, I would recommend using rand gem as gen is just your go-to name for a random number generator because it is is very descriptive. It is a random number generator. Unless you have to use multiple random number generators at the same uh, sort of scope. In that case, you would want to do a uh, different one. Uh, maybe a different name there. More helpful for what each num random number generator is doing. But at the same time, unless you're doing something very, very, very specific, you probably only need one random number generator per procedure. It doesn't really uh, benefit you to have two unless you have some very, very specific use case for it. But then, of course, um, this is generating a random number using randgen.next026. So that is how you work with a random number generator like that. All right, so I want to show off what uh, it looks like when I win this game. Because we didn't, we didn't get to see that yet. I kind of flubbed some of the previous ones. So let's see if I, how my luck is. Uh, I'm going to guess the letter T. Check that guess. The answer is it? Oh, no, you didn't see that. You didn't see that. Be cool, all right? You, you saw nothing. Um, but may, maybe, uh, I, I think Z is a good one to, to check. So why don't we do that? Um, well, yeah. What are the odds? I, I uh, got it in two guesses. That's pretty rare. Um, I guess the correct letter is Z. Cool. Well, yeah, what are the, what are the odds? Um, 25 out of 26, as it turns out. 25 out of 26 are the odds. But what happens is I've disabled the text box to guess in, text guess, and I have disabled the button to check the guess because we're not playing anymore. We, we uh, haven't started the new game, but the label itself still remains. So I can brag to my friends about my super rare and awesome achievement that I got that was totally legitimate. Uh, and all I can do is either hit new game or hit exit. I'll hit new game again. Let's see if I can do any better. Uh, I'll do Y this time. I'm feeling pretty good about Y. Um, the answer is P, but you didn't hear it from me. Well, better check P. Yeah, I got the, the correct letter. Uh, so, yeah, that's what's going on. It, when I start the new game, it erases the previous guesses and enables the text box and the check guess button. And then when I win the game, it disables the text box and the check guess button, but leaves the label intact. I can never beat my record of two. Can't do it. I'll have to maybe cheat a little harder next time. But that is just some ways of using the random number generator here and enabled and focus like that. All right, so now what I'm going to talk about are two properties of a text box, max length and password char. Uh, the max length property sets the Max string length inside is the maximum number of characters that are allowed within that string. It's a non-negative integer, so it has to be at least zero. Uh, the user cannot type more than max length number of 
characters. So if I set it to be five, you can't type in six. Uh, if you try to type in six or seven or eight or whatever, it does nothing. So it doesn't replace any of the previously typed characters. It just doesn't put them into the text box. Uh, and then the password char property, um, which is a Boolean value, uh, that will display asterisks instead of user text. Sort of like when you're typing a password into a website and it gives you a whole bunch of dots instead of your actual password. Uh, it it just displays asterisks rather than displaying text. The user text is still held in the dex dot text property. It's just not actually shown in the application. Uh, typically, this kind of thing would be used to hide passwords and often comes with a show button that would toggle the password char property. Um, but yeah, that, that would be a typical use. However, don't use Visual Basic to collect passwords. At least not with the language, the uh, you know, the knowledge that we have. Because if you have the user type in a password, and then compare the password to like a string that you have saved in your program, that's really bad. Because that string is stored somewhere in memory, which means that someone could theoretically get into memory and look at that string and see what the password is while your application is running, and then take that password out of memory and actually type it into your um, application from there and get access to whatever you're trying to hide. So it's bad practice to use Visual Basic to collect passwords like this. Never save your passwords um, inside of your application or inside of a, you know, yeah, it, it, don't save them inside of your application. That's a really bad idea. Um, it's just a really useful, cool thing to do sometimes for some applications. All right, so... What we have here is a guess the word game now instead of guess the letter. Uh, this is actually a two-player game, so you can interact with it. Um, yeah, you are able to play this game with me right now. Doesn't matter when you're watching, where you're watching, or anything like that. You're able to participate. So, let's actually get into it. Uh, what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in the word. And all of you who are watching are going to guess the letters in that word. So I'm going to use, now, I don't mean to brag, but I'm going to use my go-to for this type of game. It uh, really stumps people. So I will type it out. Now five letters. You'll see that password char is actually enabled right here as evidenced by the asterisks in the word text box. So I've typed in my word, I click new word, everything up here gets disabled, and then I uh, actually get to type in the letter for all of you. So what I want you to do right now is either, you know, comment a letter for me to use, or just yell really loudly and I'll probably hear it. Alright. Yeah, no, I'm... Okay, uh, there's a lot of... Ooh. No, it's kind of hard to get, like, one letter out of the... I, okay, 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 okay. I'll, I'll choose... I, I see a lot of this one, so I'm going to try um, S. S is a pretty good starting letter. Uh, so I'll try this letter. Oh, it didn't work so well. All right. All right, is there another one? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. A lot of vowels this time. Okay, okay. I, I, I see where you're getting at. Um, yeah, vowels are good. E. E. Alright, let's do E. Most common uh, letter in English is what I've heard, so let's see how it goes. Oh! Look at that! There's two of them! That was a really good guess. Um, Alright, I won't keep up the charade anymore. Let's, uh, I'll do G. We try again. I'll just type in the rest of the letters right here. F. Try it. Uh, D, try it, X, try it, I guess it, it's FedEx. Uh, FedEx was always a really good one when I would play word guessing games like this growing up. Uh, no one ever really seemed to expect it for whatever reason, but it works pretty well. So I'll hit OK and it lets me type in a new word. So all the guessing stuff is disabled and the putting words in stuff is enabled but I'll just exit for now. 
So what's happening right here is in the new word procedure, it's checking to see if we have a valid word. It should be five letters exactly. Um, if so, then it uh, disables all the stuff that lets you type in stuff and enables all the stuff that lets you uh, guess stuff. It sets up the um, text with hyphens and it gives the uh, letter guessing part focus. Otherwise, it gives you this error about five letters. So let's try to enter in some invalid input. I'll type in A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. See, it's not letting me actually um, type in more than five letters like this. And in fact, it's giving me some errors. My computer is yelling at me for doing that. Uh, but what we'll see is I type in A, B, C, D, E. The string that I kept was A, B, C, D, E. Uh, everything after that, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, whatever, uh, all of that was completely thrown out. Also of note is that even though this, all of this stuff looks like asterisks, when we um, actually, you know, Oh, actually, that's another cool thing, but even though all of this looks like asterisks, uh, we're, we're actually able to get the real word out of the uh, dot text property of text word here. Um, also, you're not allowed to copy and paste from something that's marked as a password field, so you can't actually cheat, which is pretty helpful. So I'll exit the program there. Another thing we can show off is, you know, we know based on the password char property of this text box, which was actually set in the designer, not set in code at all. But if I type in less than five letters, uh, I get this error, please enter five. Or if I put in a number, one, two, three, I get an error as well. So that's you know another good use of this like operator. Not only are we controlling for the length, but we're also making sure that there are only letters in here. Uh, and the letters can also be uppercase or lowercase thanks to this uh, to upper bit right here. And also trim is really nice to have. All right, uh, in the try letter part of this whole thing, um, you know, we get the word, the letter, and the result, you know, the word from the text box that is actually disabled, but we can still get the word from the uh, dot text field of it, trim to upper, the letter we get from the you know, the letter text box trim to upper. The result we get uh, just from the label. That's the previous result that was in there. We check to see if the letter is in the word. And, you know, we're, we're assuming that there's no um, guesses or duplicate guesses, but this still works fine for duplicate guesses. Uh, all that happens is um, there's, it, it just replaces every instance of, um, you know, for, for every, for every instance where the character in the word equals the letter, then it replaces that same index with the letter. So that's a really helpful, um, way to go about it. Uh, it's just, Checking the word to see if it contains the letter. If the word does contain the letter, then for every instance of the word containing the letter, um, it replaces that the hyphen that is in the correct position with that letter. Now, um, we can't actually use the dot replace method here because remember that the dot replace method it doesn't replace at a specific index but rather it replaces a specific substring. Uh, but all of the strings that we would want to replace are hyphens, but there are also hyphens that we don't want to replace just yet. So what we, we actually have to identify the index of every single instance of that letter. And then at each, uh, at the index of each instance, we have to replace the index of the result with that letter. Uh, you could do this with substrings as well, like chopping up substrings and then using int in, uh, the uh, index of method, but this for loop also works pretty well. Um, and then you just update what the label says. And then if the result has no more hyphens in it, that means that the user has guessed the entirety of the word. So it shows that 
you know, you guessed it and it puts the word there and then it switches it the uh, enabled stuff so that the user can um, type in a new word but are, is not able to guess. And then it changes the focus over to the word text box as opposed to the um, letter guess box. Otherwise, there's a try again message if it doesn't contain the letter. So that's what's going on behind the scenes there. All right, and that is the end of this addendum. Uh, thank you all so much for sticking with it. I hope you got some really cool things out of learning more about strings. There's some really cool concepts in here that are very exciting. So I hope this gives you a lot of tools to make some very exciting output and do some very fun things with user input. Uh, I look forward to seeing what y'all are able to do with it.